Hi, this is Eric from LongboxReview.com. Welcome to the show. Uh, I would like to uh, also welcome my very special guest. Uh, we're going to be talking about some Birds of Prey comics. And so welcome to the show, MJ from the Nerd Goggles podcast. Hi, MJ. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, thank you for, for agreeing to do this. Um, <laughs> I know it's been a long time in, in coming because uh, MJ does, uh, as I said, the Nerd Goggles podcast. Uh, primarily, she talks about books that she has read that she really likes, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, uh, she had released an episode, I think it was about, uh, I, I killed, no, and I, I was going to say I killed giants. You've done that one. I know that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, that's not the one. And it's, I'm suddenly <laughs> blanking on it now. I'll have to remember it later, but, uh, you did one in November of last year where you talked about a, a trade, uh, a, a, of a, was really going to bug me that I can't remember this book now, <laughs> but was it umbrella uh, Academy. There was that one too, but I think it was the oh, one before, before that. that. Uh, anyway, um, she talked about this one book. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> I can't remember what it is. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, that prompted me to uh, to reach out to MJ on Twitter and and say, hey, any, if you would uh, like to come on my show and talk about any comic that you'd like, uh, I'd love to have you. And uh, uh, MJ suggested that we talk about the, uh, the the basically the first volume of the Gail Simone written Birds of Prey which are uh, issues 56 to 61, and it's, it's under the, 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 the title of Of Like Mind. So that if you look at that, uh, look for that book, um, uh, say on Amazon or wherever you get your trades. Uh, it's also available digitally, which, digitally, uh, which uh, I think, uh, MJ, you said you, you have those digitally, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, and, and I got them as well. It actually so happened when we talked about that, uh, Comixology was having a buy one get one sale, and so that's how I was able to to get uh, these issues um, somewhat cheaply, uh, which is good because uh, I looked at this earlier. The Birds of Prey Volume One trade, if you go on Amazon and look for it, uh, it's not cheap because it's out of print. Oh wow! <laughs> so you know, I'm looking at it says eight new from forty five ninety six. So 40, 40, 46 bucks for a, for this trade. That is new. like triple the price. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Probably of a regular trade. Wow. Uh, so it, so we, like I said, we'll be talking about that. But first, I want to I want to talk about MJ and her show Nerd Goggles. So <laughs> MJ, do you want to uh, introduce yourself real quick to the to the listeners and tell us about Nerd Goggles? Because you know I love the show. I want other people to to come listen and and uh, and love the show as much as I do. Sure. Thanks. Um, so I looked real quick. The The November episode was Giant Days. That's what it is. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that was a fun book, too. I got to check out the second volume. Um, so I guess, OK, well, I'm MJ. My that's the name that I use on most of my social medias for my podcast. And um, I guess the whole premise of what got me to start uh, to start my podcast was every time I would read a book, and I would talk to my sister or a friend. I would. I didn't want to spoil the book, but they're always like, "I'm never going to read it. Just tell me everything." So we'd sit and I would just like tell them. And I kind of in the beginning, I didn't want to do like you know talk so much about. So it was a learning process, as it always is, right? When you first start a podcast, you're trying to feel out what you wanted to do. So you know that first episode was really super long, and I didn't mean it to be. <laughs> and I wanted you know interject my my points across or certain references, which I think I've gotten better at. I hope over the years. But um, that was kind of the point of it. I kind of wanted to recap what I was reading because I figured there's a lot of people that might not want to read a book. And I didn't want to do it, um, I guess, the same as everybody else. I was trying to be a little bit different. So I would throw in sound effects or jokes. Like one of the things I, I love is jokes. So I'm always trying to get people. Eric has sent me jokes. Um, <laughs> really, I'm always really trying to get people. Jokes. <laughs> but I, that's what I like. But And it's hard to get people to record the joke and send it to me. Like I'll have people send me jokes and write them, but it's very hard to get them to record it and then let me put it on the podcast because they are embarrassed. And I'm like, nobody knows who you are. It's okay. You can do it. And it's funny. And so I like to, I, I try to do this as often as I can um, to put it in the front of the show is to put a joke and just kind of start lighthearted or, you know, sometimes I'll throw in music. I'll talk about, um, I always have my, my first segment I'll say in quotes is um, things that I'm thinking about. And so I, 
kind of wanted to, I threw that in there, I guess, so people can kind of get to know me a little bit. And the other things that I like besides just reading the book. Um, so I'll talk about TV and movies and music, uh, concerts and stuff that I've gone to or like vacations just to, to let people kind of get to know me a little bit and then just go in and then talk about the book. Well, that's, that's one of the things I, I really love about your show is, is, is that how you, you share these things about what's going on in your life or the things you like, you know, things you're enjoying. Um, in, in fact, that's, that's in large part why I started doing for my, my gutters, the gutters episodes that I do every once in a while, I started doing something similar. So I'm, I apologize that I, I stole your <laughs> shtick, but, no, it's okay. but, but I, it's, it's such a really cool way to, uh, cause I feel like I, I kind of know you. Even though this, so uh, so people are, uh, who are listening to this, uh, MJ and I are actually on Skype. We're we're actually seeing each other on the video feed. Um, this is the first time that I've actually spoken to MJ. Even though I feel like I said I feel like I know you a little bit because of your show. Listening to your show, uh, you also uh, share things on Twitter. I follow you on Twitter, and people should go follow MJ on Twitter. There, we'll 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 uh, direct you to that later. <laughs> but. Um, uh, you know, because I, you know, through through the way that you share these things, I, you know, like I, like I said, I feel like I know you a little bit. I know you like to to ride your bike at least in the summertime. I know you love to go to concerts. You're always going to concerts, so <laughs> it's amazing how many concerts that you go to. Um, and you introduced me to, oh man, now I'm blanking on the, the band churches. Name. Churches, yes, that's it, exactly. And I, I I absolutely love that band now. So. You know, it's 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 a it's a wonderful Fantastic. way to get to know someone uh, in in the, this new digital age, if you will. Um, so I'm I'm very happy. I'm very excited to to be able to actually talk to you in person. Well, so to speak, in person, but as as, as in person as we could uh, as we can um, uh, today. So this is this is really cool. And and so thank you for inspiring me, inspiring me um, to 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 uh, share more uh, instead of just doing my usual thing that I do about talking about comics. <laughs> so I, I, I've really been enjoying um, exploring that part of, of my show. And so uh, I encourage listeners to go listen to Nerd Goggles and, and, and feel that way about you and, and, and get to know you better. Um, but, I mean, like you said, primarily, though, you, you started the show uh, to talk about books. Or actually, you mm-hmm. were uh, – because I, 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 I mentioned this to MJ before we started recording, but I went back and listened to her very first episode. And just so you know, uh, uh, listeners um, – uh, MJ started Nerd Goggles back in 2012. Uh, she, you have released uh, 47 episodes plus that that uh, intro zero episode, and <laughs> I did the same thing when I started my show. I, I did an, ep- an episode zero, and of course nowadays, you know, you know the big podcast uh, podcast uh, nistas or whatever, <laughs> they're, they're, you know, they tell you don't release an episode zero. I was like, well, too late. <laughs> I'm not going to go back and renumber everything, but uh, uh, I went back and listened to that and uh, discovered that you um, were looking. You know, you wanted to do a podcast, right? And and you were looking for something different. You want? Do you want to talk about that? Um. Yeah, I just I think well, I didn't have a co-host, and I think a lot of the ones that I was listening to all had a co-host, so it was kind of felt like I was going to do this by myself. And I mean, if anybody wanted to come on and talk with, you know, don't, we don't necessarily all read the same books because it's different than when I, I think with comics, it's kind of easier to find somebody who read that um, and have them on a show and talk about it. Because I've been on comics, you know, other po- comic podcasts, but for books, it's you, it's sometimes it's hard to find somebody like your friends. Like I said, you know, none of my friends read the same books as me. Um, so whenever I'm telling them, oh, this is what I'm reading. I, you know, I would spoil the whole thing. I would basically just sit there and tell them every part of the book. And we would just laugh about it and talk about other things, you know, as I did it. And I thought, you know, that's kind of like what I want to do, I guess, um, is just is do that. Because I, I didn't know any other podcast that talked about books. And in the beginning, I was kind of doing more YA books and some graphic novels. But I've kind of um, moved away from just doing YA books and doing some other books that I'm reading to, um, you know, things that I'm interested in. I have a, and audiobooks also. That was another thing. So sometimes I'm listening to audio audiobooks, and I'll do, you know, a podcast. Some of my podcasts have been on that too. So it's not just necessarily just um, novels or graphic novels, but it's also audiobooks, and I'll talk about those. And I found some. And it's kind of cool when you're looking through, I guess, iTunes, and you kind of find like an indie book because I've done a couple of books that I never, 
I don't think I ever would have saw on a bookshelf. And I just kind of picked it up on iTunes and then listened to it. And I was like, oh, that's that was pretty cool. And I, I don't think I ever would have found this before, you know. So that's kind of the um, I guess that's kind of just the gist of what I was trying to do. And then just have fun. I wanted to have fun with it. Like I said, I put in, you know, sound effects or like sometimes like little songs or something that I made because I just wanted it to feel personal, too. Mm-hmm. I didn't want it to. I didn't want to do something and then people not feel like they were getting me and just getting like the stuff that I was talking about, I guess. So um, that was kind of, I guess, uh, the little, uh, I guess what I was looking for, if that makes any sense. Because I know a lot of times like people don't want to talk about themselves and, you know, with good reason. It's it's, it's kind of a scary world. You don't want to put too much of your stuff out there. But at the same time, I wanted to make something that, was the cert that I guess encompassed stuff that I liked, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. And then just, just to feel more personal and not to just follow, you know, what everybody else I guess was doing. Yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're all, there's different facets of our lives that informs the thing that, you know, for example, uh, my show is almost entirely about comic books, <laughs> but that's only one, one part of my life, but all those other parts inform that aspect of, of what I talk about. So I think I think uh, you've hit on something which I think is very important in, especially for like solo podcasters. Perhaps um, I guess it doesn't matter if you're solo or not, but but just offering uh, your audience a little bit of yourself, you know, that helps not only inform you know why you're why you view the, these pieces of entertainment the way that you do. But um, also informs you know the, your audience of who you are a little bit, and and you maybe get, develop that connection as as I feel like I have I've done with you in listening to your show. So I I, I it's a, I think it was a great a great thing that you're doing. Um, you were one of the very first podcasts that I listened to where I heard people like you doing that, and I really responded to it as 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 people can guess in the in the way that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, you and your show. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I think it's a really cool thing that you, you started or, well, you started it for your show, but I mean, I, I think of you as kind of like a trendsetter for, <laughs> for podcasting in general for that. Well, and the thing is, is like, I tried, I, I mean, you've heard it sometimes when I'm talking in there, I'm, I try to talk to the audience, like they're there with me. I was like, so sometimes the way I phrase things, it's some, the same thing, like when we're um, talking about the, when I do my Twitter watches, I, you know, I, I'm trying to pretend that other people are there watching it with me. I don't want to just like talk and then not, um, I guess, forget that somebody's listening. And I know I've heard other people when they're, um, when they've done their podcast by themselves after having like co-hosts and they're like, oh, I'm here by myself. I feel weird. I feel like I'm just talking to air or I'm not talking to some, you know, to anybody else. And I'm like, well, I just, you know, I just imagine that they're like, you know, you and I talking to each other. I just imagine that the person who's listening to me is there and I'm talking to them. So that's one of the things that I do try to do is I just, I try not to talk like I'm just by myself, I'm trying to have a conversation with somebody and, and hopefully that comes across. That's, that's kind of like one, I guess one of the things that I'm trying to, to push when I do my, my podcast. Well, I think, I think you're doing a really good job at that. That's, and, that, and that's, that's my approach too. I, I've, I've gotten questions from other people about how, you know, how do you, how do you do a solo podcast like that? You're just sitting there talking about stuff. I'm like, yeah, but but I'm I'm talking to people. I you know it's it's yeah. I'm just me in a room and a microphone. But I'm talking to you, mm-hmm. um, even though you you're not there. <laughs> it's it's a weird it is a weird thing, right? <laughs> I Which guess is, you just have to not think about it. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. for 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 someone else who might think, oh, I don't know if I can do that by myself. You know, don't think about that. You're by yourself. You are talking to mm-hmm. somebody. Mm-hmm. You just don't know who that person is that is listening to you. Well, so, so let me ask you this: uh, when uh, growing up uh, as a youngster, I was I was really shy, like painfully shy. Like I would not look at, at a person's face shy when I walked by them, and and I and I started changing that when I when I got to high school. Uh, you know, that age, you know, you're a teenager and stuff, uh, you, you kind of want to reinvent yourself, right? And so I went through that. Um, wh- how were you growing up? Were you were you? Uh, uh, a talkative kid? Were you shy? So, what was what was young MJ like compared to uh, current MJ? Who young MJ probably never shut up. To be honest, <laughs> um, <laughs> I was. Well, I'm the oldest of of the three. Um, I do have an older sister, but of um, 
of the three from my parents, of my two parents, there's three of us. I'm the oldest. I'm like almost four years older than my sister that's after me. There's three of us, three girls. And so I, um, most of the time, I didn't have anybody. So I was by myself. And my uncle, my mom's younger brother, was seven when I was born. So he was always been kind of like our brother. Mm. So I had him and some of my older cousins. And so I guess because I was the younger one, I was always just trying to catch up to them. So I was always talking. And I remember always telling my uncle, like, when he would do something, like, lift. I remember one time he was lifting weights. And I was like, I can do that. And he's like, you're always saying you could do things. You can't do this. It's too heavy. And I'm like, no, I can't. And then, you know, of course, I would try. I used to annoy him so much. <laughs> but it was like, so I was like the annoying younger sister to him. And, um, but it was a lot of stuff like that. I was just, I was always talking. I always thought I could do everything, which I guess is not a bad thing. We should think that we could do everything, mm-hmm. you know, and then you try. And if you fail, well, then at least, you know, you tried, right? Instead of not um, having done it at all. But um, I think now, and I've always been, um, I've had, nowadays I have like some friends and stuff like that that tell me that I'm kind of like a an extroverted introvert or introvert extrovert where they'll, <laughs> you know, they'll say like, you're, you're really there for like a certain amount of time and then all of a sudden you just go real quiet and then you don't really say anything anymore. And, um, I, and I guess that's kind of, I guess, the way that I am now. I just I exert all of this energy and then just kind of just kind of lay back and have to, you know, regroup and then yeah. uh, get, you know, be all talkative all over again. But I've always been, I think, I don't think I've ever really been shy, shy. Like, I always would get nervous. I, I think I threw up every first day of school until oh. I finished high school, like oh, literally. No. Yeah. I don't know why I always would be nervous the first day of school. And um, so then I stopped eating breakfast, I think, in high school. So I was like, I'm just going to throw it up. I'm not even going to eat breakfast. Um, so it was terrible. But I would still go, you know, always talk to people, always meeting people. Um, I would always switch friends, I guess. Some people, you know, and, you know, you have, like, your core friends and stuff like that. And I would always just, like, I, I hate to say that I would get, like, bored. But I just like to meet people. So I'd always just... You know, I'd hang out with some people and they'd still be my friends, but then I'd always want to go and meet other people. I didn't want to just be kind of stuck with just the same people and not venture out and meet other people. Um, so I would always kind of change, not um, I guess change groups, but I wouldn't like stay with this group, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Like I would just, I would want to just hang out with other people on lunch. I didn't always want to be with the same people. So sometimes I, you know, I would go with my friends and then I would go and, you know, talk to other people around. I think I probably started that in like junior high and high school. Um, or maybe my ninth grade year was in junior high. So probably from ninth to 10th, if that makes sense. But I was at a different school for ninth grade for freshman year, um, where I was just like, I just wanted to talk to other people. And I didn't because they were, there was a lot of I don't know if this was a 90s thing, but there was a lot of like clicky, like clicks going on. Like we had a group of kids that were called the Brady Bunch um, because they all dressed the same and then they all dated each other. Mm. um yeah so they were always um and then the funny thing is the ones that named them the brady bunch were the stoners who everybody Mm. called the stoners Mm -hmm. and so the stoners named them all the brady bunch and then that kind of carried on to them but some of them were cool so sometimes i would want to just like hang out you know talk to them and i guess that's kind of like the way i am too i go out just sometimes I, i go to a lot of the concerts by myself um which is was nerve wracking in the beginning but now it's super fun. Um, I talk to people. I talk to people in the queue when I'm standing in line. Um, sometimes I'll hang out with them, you know, depending. Like um, sometimes I'll just hang out by myself. Um, but I think just trying different things, I guess, since I've always been that way and um, just doing things, I guess, in different ways. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like I still um, talk to people but I just am more but I'm more of a loner these days if that makes sense (laughs) um I just do it all by myself I just kind of am used to it it's like I like I'm I'm always tweeting about how like all my friends are like married and have kids now and I'm like the single one so it's like just navigating those types of things it's kind of just like weird you know and I still have my friends and I talk to them and all that kind of stuff but it's it's just a weird dynamic now because they're you know they have a different life than I do so I can go do all these things. And they're always telling me, I'm living vicariously through you. And then I feel like I have pressure, you know. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, now I can't just stay home and relax. I got to go out and tell you guys what I'm doing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I've always, I think, I've been a talkative person. But it's just a little bit, I just do it differently now mm-hmm. than I did when I was younger. So uh, 
how much then has because uh, I'm thinking of your your, your Twitter timeline mm-hmm. uh, where you're, you're sharing all this stuff about TV shows, the concerts we mentioned. Um, uh, are you is 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 Twitter like that? Is that your your current outlet for that kind of uh, uh, sharing uh, that kind of information that you want to you want to put out there? Yeah, I think um, in the beginning, I think when I started reading more comics like on my own, I know I had mentioned earlier that uh, originally my, my introduction to comics was like my uncle who would give me stuff. When I uh, was looking kind of, well, he had passed away and I started looking for a community of people to talk to about these things. And so I went on some comic forums and I started doing that. But I think once, um, I guess once some of the some of the people, like including you, who I started kind of getting to know, I guess, like moving on to social media, and I just started kind of following you guys there and talking to you guys there and getting to know you differently was um, I just started to making that my main platform, I guess, after that Mm -hmm. um, for those type of things. And I did try to keep it super clean in the beginning, but then I just kind of got to the point where I was like, that's, I didn't feel like I was being myself either. And so I'm like, I have to, I feel like you just always have to be um, yourself, even in a safe, in a safe way. I know part of the fear is like um, people, I guess like your job, there's always this fear that your job's going to find your stuff. And that's why people put their stuff on private or, you know, they don't say the things that they normally would. Um, and I know that, you know, that has come back to other people, things that they tweet. And I, I, I try not to, I mean, I'm not like a, um, you know, I, I don't think I say problematic things and I don't think I'm a problematic person, but you never know, like something you might say might trigger somebody, exactly. you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> So, um, but one of the things was like, I didn't want to like curse on my timeline. Um, I try not to curse on my, my, um, on my podcast either, because I do have a potty mouth. I, I curse up a storm. And so I, but sometimes it slips out and sometimes I do. And I have like my favorite words, but, um, now I guess the last couple of years though, I think just with the things that have been going on, I just kind of, I don't, um, I guess I don't want to play it too safe. If that makes any sense, mm-hmm. I want to just I want to say the things that are on my mind because I feel like it's important. But at the same time, I don't I don't want to say too many things that don't make any sense because it's hard to say things in two hundred what is it two hundred and sixty characters. Yeah, you can't always get your point across. <laughs> um, or you say something like um, I don't know if that's okay to say, but the because um, you had commented at me, but that one actor from that one show who came at me for a comment that I made uh, oh, tweeting right. about a show. And, um, I was, I wasn't prepared for that because usually the only people that ever comment at me are fans of something. And, um, every once in a blue moon, maybe a writer from a show has said something, but it's usually off of a positive tweet, I guess, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that I made of the show. Sometimes a writer or a producer might say like, thank you, or I appreciate it. Um, but, and I didn't even think what I had said was that bad. It wasn't. I don't even think it was bad. And I wish I would have said it a different way too, because of how I actually, the things that were going on my mind, you know, but I didn't continue it because you don't think that you have to explain yourself sometimes, you know, that someone's going to say something and you have to continue and, 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 and like defend yourself. And I felt like I had to defend myself, but it was, um, I wasn't expecting that from somebody who was on a show. And yeah. I just felt like then what I said got kind of misinterpreted, <laughs> misinterpreted it. No, was that the word? But well, you know what I'm saying? I, um, <laughs> I think that, I think that actor was just a little too sensitive. I think so too. And, um, and, but I did appreciate, you know, you commenting back at me because I was just like, I got kind of frantic because he just kept going. And then, you know, if, if in real life, if somebody comes at me, I go back at them. You know, I don't just like shut down. I'm, you know, I'm, like, I'm, I'm a spunky person, but you're not used to that kind of thing on Twitter, especially if you're not like famous or anything like that, you know, because mm-hmm. you see, you know, you see like what happens to people who have the little stars by their name. Um, but it's like, I have... I don't know how many real followers, you know? <laughs> um, so it was just kind of, I was kind of taken aback by, by that type of thing. And I, and I was like, should I then just be careful when I say something? But I felt like what I had said was important um, that I wanted to say, you know, but maybe he just didn't get the context because he didn't even know what scene I was really talking about, I think, because it was just a random I knew what I was watching and I made a comment. And then when I was thinking back on it, I was like, maybe he thought I meant this scene, mm-hmm. but I just, you know, I was just started replaying everything in my mind, like um, thinking that there wasn't enough context for what he was saying to me. And then I knew what I meant, you know, but it was just like, 
how do I do this now? Because I don't want other people on to come at me like this. And then I had to mute the conversation too, because then some people were commenting back. <laughs> Um, some people were siding with me and some people were siding with him, but I was like, I can't deal with this. This is this is too much interaction here. So I muted that conversation. So I don't know like how it went, you know, after that. <laughs> but um I think uh it didn't really stop me too much, but now I'm just like trying not to too much, I guess, hashtag the shows when I'm watching them if I want to say something. Mm-hmm. But I mean you can't always have positive criticism if something is not um up to par. I try not to be mean though. Or like even um, I, how do you say um, you know some some people were at the person, you right. know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. an actor or a singer or something, and 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 talk badly to them. And I'm like, I don't know this person. I'm not gonna say you know, hey, so and so, you you know, blah 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 blah. I'm just I'll just say my comment or because some of them they some of the people like I don't know if you follow like Chrissy Teigen. She reads all of her stuff even if you don't at her. You know, <laughs> I see. <laughs> You know, um, there's like, you know, there's a few people are like Roxanne Gay. She's another one where they just they see their their name pop up and they see it. You know, someone didn't even at them. And so I'm like, when you I feel like when you at somebody, you are purposely get, trying to get their attention yeah. and instigate something. Mm-hmm. And that's not something that I want to do. I think I did that once. I think it was to early on in Twitter because I didn't really understand how Twitter worked, I guess. And um, because I had it for a year before I actually started really using it. And then I think I had said something about um, (laughs) about John Mayer, but I don't think I added him. I think I just said his name and it was something about his floppy hat. And I had made this comment about the floppy hat and it just really sounded kind of a-holy. And I don't know if you can curse on your podcast, so (laughs) I'll try to clean it up. And it was right before I think he was on Jimmy Kimmel or something like that. And he had, he was talking about how he had the, um, the surgery in his throat or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm all, I just made fun of him. And he just was going through a thing. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, I should not be like that type of person. And so I deleted it and I felt bad about it. And I tried to never do anything like that again. Um, so <laughs> I totally forgot what we were, what the question was, but it was just, you know, I just try to be careful of what the things I say, but still be myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it, it's just, a, it's just a weird space. I think that, that we inhabit, um, you know, like we were talking about before with how we're sharing th- yes. these things that we love. Um, and we might be critical of them. Uh, and we might, we might be critical of some of the stuff we, we are going to talk about here in, in just a few minutes not for birds of prey. Um, but it's, but it, you know, what I, what I don't like about, about our, I guess our current culture. Um, and I even hate using that phrase, but it seems almost like some people's attitude is that if you criticize at all, that's a bad thing. And that is just, that's just a totally wrong attitude to have or, or a mindset to have because criticism is not does not always equal negativity, mm-hmm. and to be critical of something, uh, a creative thing, is um, you know that's a good thing. It's 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 allowing us to interact with that piece of art and try to come to terms with it, or or you know um, at the very least describe it, or you know how does it make you feel that kind of thing, uh, and it also has sometimes has the benefit of of being able to improve the art, um, mm-hmm. you know, if the artist takes that criticism to heart, and believe me, I've I've gotten some criticism about my own show that I, you know, I I took to heart, and I, I'm you know I made, uh, I decided to make some changes about it, try to without without going too far, you know, because I I don't mm-hmm. want to stray too far from what I think of as me, my you know my quote unquote brand mm-hmm. <laughs> for this show, um, uh, but. I, I, I certainly, I just don't understand that I, that, that attitude, that idea that criticizing anything is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. It just, it just isn't. No, it's not. And you know, the thing is, it's like, I went, I have a BA in graphic design. Um, so I, you know, I went to school, I didn't go to an art school. I was an art major. And that's one of the biggest things is being critiqued on your work. I mean, every single art class that you take, you present it to the class and your your teacher rips it apart your teacher your professor rips it to shreds every time <laughs> um, 
And then, you know, your peers are there too, and they're making comments. Some of them are positive, and some of them are negative. But they usually try, I think, um, and that's one of the things I think they try to teach you in those classes is that you, you know, you kind of have to be able to roll with the punches. You need to be able to take, to take the good with the bad. But then at the same time, when you do have, like, either way, if you're giving a, um, any kind of positive input or you're giving any kind of negative input, there should always be some sort of, like, context as to why you should explain why it was not. And don't just say, oh, I didn't like that. Yeah. Or, you know, that was terrible. Or, um, you know, sometimes I'll see, because I follow a lot of musicians, I'll see people say, like, oh, your last album sucked. Okay, well, why did it suck? You know, if you're just going to come at somebody and, and, like I said, actually at them, why don't you tell them what you didn't like about it mm-hmm. instead of just saying your last album sucked? Well, that doesn't help. How does that help them later on to improve if they if they take that to heart? Mm-hmm. You're, I feel like some comments like that are kind of just you're just being mean. Yeah, I think, you know, you're not actually doing anything constructive. And that's what you want when you're when you're critiquing something. It's supposed to be constructive. So if you're just saying something negatively or the same thing, how, um, you know, I don't want to still into too deep of controversial things, you know, in the comics world. But when people talk about diversity and being upset about it, I'm like, how is that? Even? That's uh, to me, that's not even a critique. How can you critique actual something that is in our real life? This is a diverse world. There's different people in it. So how can you even say anything I feel like bad about it? Um, I mean, there's bad people. <laughs> um, but in general, like, how can you you know, not want the, to see the, the people that you see crossing the street in things that you consume right. and in um, movies and TV, in comic books? You know, those um, I want to see real people. I don't want to see. Um, I know like. I see more, um, just to kind of, I'm just going to go into it a little bit, but you know, where I come from, I see more brown people. Mm -hmm. I see more people of color. Um, so, you know, I want to see more of that. I don't complain when I don't see that. Um, sometimes I do a little bit, but it just depends on how it's because how sometimes they portray us. Um, and and when I say us people, I am a person of color. (laughs) I'm Puerto Rican. Um, I'm a brown person just in case you have never seen me. But, um, you know, a lot of times we're not portrayed the way that we actually are. So sometimes like, um, you know, like on the show that I was talking about, that was one of the things I had, you know, mentioned. I I feel like if you don't portray somebody the way that they actually generally are, then it's not you're not telling a truth. You know, and that's something I think then you can say, hey, you know, I think you should fix this. But to actually come out and just say, well, I don't want any people of color in my things. I don't want any. LGBT people and the thing, LGBT people and the things that I consume, then that's a that's totally a fantasy world. Yeah, you know that's not a world that we live in. Mm-hmm. And so, um, oh, I forgot the question again. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep I'm trying to make. I'm thinking I'm making this too deep. I'm sorry, Eric. <laughs> um, but oh, we're talking about criticism. So just um, you know, it's when the whole thing about criticism. Like I said, just to repeat what I just said, um, is it supposed to it's supposed to be constructive and help the person. It's not supposed to bring them down. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, that's kind of like you said, our, our culture is everybody has an opinion, but it's nobody wants to kind of, I guess, back up their opinion. Yeah. You know, they just want to say something, but they never want to back it up. And I, I, don't, I don't, I don't think that's the way that it should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's something that I'm, <laughs> I'm, my wife and I are trying to impart to our, or we've always tried to impart this to our kids and, and, and our, our grandchildren now, the, um, especially the, the two that are living with us, Maddie and Gabby, is that it's not enough to have an opinion. You have to have an informed opinion. You know, you have to have perspective and respectful in the way that you express your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately, and I'm going to sound like, you know, grumpy, grumpy old guy, but, you know, it sounds like, you know, kids today... <laughs> <laughs> they're they're just you know and I, I blame social media to 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 some degree um it's just really it's really easy to hide behind an avatar and, and, a, mm-hmm. and a fake name and just spout off this crap about anything and and not in, really engage so it, it's yeah i anyway uh i'll get off that soapbox but. <laughs> i know sorry I, I i i helped i climbed up on that soapbox no no with that's, you. Fine. that's fine <laughs> Uh, I, I I love talking about though art you know the you know art with a capital A, and what that means and and how you know uh, how we are supposed to interact with it and engage with it. Uh, I mean that's primarily why I do this podcast, talking about 
the pieces of art that I, you know, grew up loving and continue uh, mm-hmm. all these many years later. <laughs> um, I still I still love it. And, and and that's one of the things that um, when you had mentioned, sorry to cut you off, but one of the things you kind of just really like blurped out real quickly was, um, you know, sometimes you make a comment and like, and I think I usually see it more with comic artists than I do with um, writers. But if you do say you didn't like something, then they um, a lot of times I see them get really, really upset about it. And I've had I had somebody comment on one of my podcasts that I did early on one of the artists because I had commented on it. And I might not be a professional, but I have studied this. And I, I feel like I at least I am informed on certain things and certain ways you do certain things, you know, um, just because a person is not in the profession does not mean that they not don't know things. And right. I think that's another thing is sometimes um, like you say something and I've seen people go off on other people and I'm like, you know, they kind of do have um, a point of this criticism. And it's not usually like, like not necessarily like someone tweeted at them, but, or I've seen like, like an article. I know a lot of the times I've seen articles about how women's bodies are portrayed. And then um, the artist will get like super upset about it. And granted, some articles I don't think really have a good argument about what they're saying, but then there's other articles that do have a good argument. So you kind of have to, t- you know, take the good with the bad. But I think that's just when you get upset about it, like the way I've seen some people get upset about it, I don't, I don't think you're even helping yourself. You know, it's just like, just take it, let it go. And then the next time, just think about it when you're drawing something and just say, you know, this, this, you know, maybe this person, I mean, and I was like that in, in a lot of my art classes. I didn't listen to the teacher. I didn't do what they said until the next class mm-hmm. because I had to, I had to, had to had to have that time to reflect on it, I guess, and figure out how do I make this thing that they said I didn't do right, <laughs> but make it my own, you know, cause sometimes I, I, I always felt like they were always trying to um, kind of, uh, well, I had like one, one, uh, one professor in particular, it always seemed like she wanted everybody to do, her style of art. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, we can't do your style of art. We have to do our style of art. I mean, you can tell us to do how, you know, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen like what some artists have been doing that draw in your style. Mm-hmm. So then they draw like, you know, they draw whatever it is, their character, and then people are drawing their character, but in their style, you know, that stuff that's, I think is actually, I think that's actually a kind of a great um, thing that's been happening because it helps. I think it helps people um, strengthen their, um, their uh their skill by taking because i know i can copy i i I can sit there and i can copy someone's artwork if i'm looking at it and i can draw almost pretty much the same way that they do it but it's not mine that's theirs you know and you have to be able to create something that is your own and so that's one of the things that i kind of glad that that's happening here and i hope that that also maybe brings more artists together and and especially being critiqued because maybe some people there's a lot of artists that didn't go to art school they just taught themselves. Mm-hmm. So they probably didn't get all that critiquing and, you know, and that harassing from your teacher and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Cause it really does. I mean, it really teaches, it teaches you something. I'm, I'm, you know, <laughs> I probably like the, the, I think the worst teacher I ever had was actually a graphic design teacher and he was harsh. He was so harsh. And I was like, like all of us kind of didn't like him, but he had points mm-hmm. just the way he said it. he was always so brash. And it was like, oh, my God, some of sometimes we didn't know what the heck to do, you know. And one time he was in jury duty. So we were all doing it on the online. And so everybody read this critique of somebody's thing Ooh. and he like tore it apart. And we were just like, oh, my God. So then we all started talking amongst ourselves and we didn't know that the teachers can read what you say if you don't put them in it. <laughs> So when he came to class and we were all sitting there, he told us that he read all the comments that we all made oh, no. thinking that he was not part of this conversation. He said, because he, it was a setting that they could put on. I was like, Oh my gosh. But I'm like, but then at the same time, I'm like, well, good. You should know because what you said was really super mean to that person, you know, cause you really hurt that person's feelings, <laughs> but, but it teaches you, you know, it yeah. kind of teaches you first to have like a backbone and I think it makes you stronger to be able to take those kinds of criticisms. And, um, but it, like I said, I, I see it a lot more with artists than I do with writers. I don't know what that is. I feel like maybe, and if, I mean, if you have any pro comic artists that listen to your show, I feel like, um, and I've always had this impression of, um, of artists is I think they have more hubris 
you know, I think a lot of artists are very much into themselves. And that was kind of one of the, one of the reasons why I didn't want to be too much into that culture, because I, I, I didn't have that kind of personality. But um, and I think that's a reason why a lot of them, if you criticize, make any little criticism of their work, they just like blow up. Mm. But, um, you know, but then again, then again, like we were saying that some people say it in a way that's not constructive and they don't have any you know, points that could actually improve the person or give, you know, give them something to think about further on. But mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I think, my, I think, my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the takeaway here is uh, everyone needs to one, stop and think. Before they tweet, <laughs> and just my breathe. hand is raised. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just just chill out a little bit before you engage in in you know kind of negative, not kind of, but you know, in in a negative way with with others. So, mm-hmm. um, I, so, and just know that we we love we love the products. That's why we buy it. Yeah. So it's not really necessary. Don't take it personal. It's not a personal thing. We just you know. Most of the time, it's not a personal thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I would hope so, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's exactly, we love this, and, and that's where some of this criticism criticism comes from, is because we know we want it to be better, or, or, to be fair, we need to be better at how we internalize this work of art, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we were talking about you know, the artists here just uh, a few minutes ago. You know, I'm not a big fan of, well... Yes and no. I, uh, of Ed Bennis's art, uh, uh, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today. So mm-hmm. that maybe that's a good uh, segue to get into <laughs> into the the, the book, um, the, the the Birds of Prey issues that we're going to talk Perfect. about. Um, unless there's something else you wanted to to talk about uh, your show or no, no. I think this um, you're uh, I think you're in the right direction there. All right. We'll we'll come back. We'll circle back to to nerd <laughs> goggles at the end, and so people can uh, find out uh, where to or well. Uh, know where to find it and, and, and how to listen and all that stuff. Uh, but like I said, uh, MJ chose um, Birds of Prey. Uh, this is issues, like I said earlier, uh, 56 through 61 uh, of Like Minds. And this is the first uh, first time that Gail Simone started writing the book. Is that That's correct, right? Yeah, I believe so, yes. And is so I was wondering, um, is that is that the reason why you wanted to read this particular story? Because uh, you said earlier that you're a fan of Gail Simone. Uh, or was it some other reason that you wanted to, to visit these, these, issue, these particular issues? Well, I think for me, sometimes it's kind of interesting to see something that um, a writer that you found who's writing something currently and then going back and seeing what they wrote before mm-hmm. yeah. and seeing how they wrote. Um, before because you kind of could see that growth or maybe a deterioration depending on you know who it is um but i kept hearing because i i well i discovered that i liked gail simone's writing when i started reading batgirl Mm. and after the new 52 or during the new 52 okay and i was like oh my gosh this is amazing i've always liked batgirl but i'd never really read too much of it but um i just liked the character and i loved the way that she wrote her and i felt like you know, this was a, um, you know, she, she just wrote it in a way that it was like a person that I would want to be, I guess, the way she wrote her. You know, she was a, this strong, independent woman. She was funny. She had fun and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but she had, tra- you know, tragic stuff kept happening to her, but mm-hmm. and it was really good. And I just like, I felt emotionally invested in her series when she was writing that. So that was my first introduction to her. But I always kept seeing, I didn't read like Red Sonia or... Some of the uh, some of the dynamite books, just only because it's not my, I guess, not really my genre. So I just stayed away from it. But um, you know, but I follow her, so I read the comments, you know, and I and I see sometimes I read the synopsis of things, and uh, people kept saying how good her Birds of Prey was. So I was like, I really got to read this because I like Birds of Prey, and I know I had um, mentioned when we were first discussing this. I said my first introduction to Birds of Prey was the TV show on what was the WB, and. I thought it was super cool because I didn't know, you know, who the Huntress was in the beginning and that, you know, it was, she was supposed to be like Batman's daughter or something like that. In a Batman, was it Batman and like Catwoman's daughter or something like that, right? right. And so I was like, wow, I say this happened, you know? And so it piqued my interest and I, <laughs> and I watched the show, you know, like I said, I didn't get, I didn't read too many comics when I was younger, just whatever my, you know, my, my, my uncle would give to me. So I, I read like, um, um, like Kingdom Come or, um. What is the the big one? The um, I forgot. Oh my goodness! The one where like uh like like I I read um when they had the female Robin, 
What was that? Uh, the Dark Knight Returns? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I read The Dark Knight Returns. Oh my gosh, totally blanked out on that. So I, it was always just like sporadic stories because he was very specific at things that he wanted me to read. So, <laughs> you know, so it was specific stories I always read and um, Birds of Prey wasn't one of them. Um, so I was like, wow, I didn't know this was happening. And so I was like intrigued. And so, like I said, I watched the show and then the show got canceled. So I never really heard anything else about it. And then so... From reading Batgirl, I just saw that they kept um, I kept seeing people's comments saying how good her Birds of Prey was. So I wanted to I wanted to check it out and see um, if it would be something that I would be interested in. Also, it's interesting. I it just occurred to me because uh, you had mentioned uh, when we were discussing uh, talking about Birds of Prey, you you mentioned the TV show, and I had watched it uh, when it first aired. Uh, this was back in two thousand three, I think two thousand two. I think, it's, I think it was the end of 2002 and uh, beginning of 2003. Yeah, October 2002 through February 2003. And so uh, I actually have, I haven't watched all those episodes. <laughs> I watched the first few when it was on originally, um, and it was just it was just a little too cheesy for me. It was, uh, it was. And but I did, uh, I did. I was going to talk about this uh, tour, uh, later, but this this is a perfect time anyway. Um, I did watch rewatch the first episode. Uh, a few weeks back to see, oh, well, you know, uh, it's been a while. Maybe, you know, I, maybe I, w- you know, wasn't in the right mind to watch the show then or whatever. <laughs> maybe my tastes have changed. Mm-hmm. And and I watched that first episode and no, it, it's, it's still really cheesy, but, <laughs> but there's, there, there are some really cool things in that show mm-hmm. uh, that they, they, I think they wanted to try and explore and obviously didn't get a chance to, cause they only, yeah. it only ran for 13 episodes. It was quickly canceled. Uh, but there are a lot of things in there that, I think in today's mm-hmm. superhero TV world, it would totally work. Yeah, that's the you same know? thing that I was thinking too. Yeah, this is this is this is totally a um, a CW show. <laughs> before you know, fifteen years or more before there was a CW, a superhero TV universe. So I think it was ahead of its time. Oh yeah, it, like for a, like a bunch of different reasons, it was ahead of its time for being um, like a superhero show. It was ahead of its time for. Uh, being a a um, a all female team, mm-hmm. uh, um, superhero team, and I think just at that time people weren't really ready for that or really into that, you know. And but now with uh, this day and age, like you said, it's it would fit perfectly in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a point there. I was going. F- oh, 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 oh it was just it was just the timing, you know, because like <laughs> I said, the show ended in February two thousand three. And issue fifty six, where we're going to start talking about uh, this run of Bird, Birds of Prey, the the, the um, cover date is August mm-hmm. of two thousand three. So while, which means I, I presume that while the show was was going on, while it was being broadcast, they were doing they were producing this this very issue that we're going to talk about. You know, sometime in there. So very cool. uh, you know, DC as as DC does uh, when they have a show, they try to promote it by either starting a new comic uh with that title or with those characters um or or they they do a relaunch of some kind you know because like i said this is issue 56 it's not number one (laughs) nowadays Mm -hmm. of course they would just do a new number one (laughs) if a new show is coming out um uh but here we are uh, i think the issue before 55 and and the issues before that those are written by chuck dixon i think that's, that's I don't remember now. Yeah. It was, it was so it, but it was obviously somebody else but they brought on Gail mm-hmm. Simone and I probably should have looked up you know to see if there was some reason why they did that um why they gave her the job uh but uh but they they brought on this new team Gail Simone uh Ed Bennis is the penciler. I'm gonna, I'm going to do the the credits for for all these there. Uh Alex Lee was the inker um uh plus Rob Lee on an issue, uh, issue 60. Uh, Rob Lee also did letters for issue 60. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Hi-Fi was the colorist and separator. John Workman was the letters except for issue 60. Like I said, Rob Lee. And then Jared Fletcher did issue 61 for some reason. Um, and then Lisa Hawkins was the editor for this run of uh, Birds of Prey. Uh, so just, uh, I guess, real quick. So we talked about Gail Simone and and, and um, uh, your interest in her um, in terms of this book. Uh, I've so was this the 
first time you'd read these issues uh, in preparation for our talk, or what, had you read them before and thought, oh, this would be good to talk about? No, actually, I it was just something on my wish list that I had wanted to read, okay. and then when you you know when you um, had asked me to come on the show, and you're like, is there anything that you wanted to talk about? It was the first thing that popped into my mind. I was like, oh, this would be a, actually a good opportunity to get these books. And then it didn't look like, I think when I asked you, it didn't look like you had talked about them. Because right. so, I didn't want to do something you had talked about either. And so um, I think it was just kind of a perfect, it just worked perfectly, I think. Yeah, it did. Uh, like you, it's, it's, this is, I, I heard over the years that Birds of Prey, uh, the one, uh, the, the run written by Gail Simone, was really, really good. And I'd always intended on going back at some point and, and maybe getting some trades or whatever uh, to start reading this. So, yeah, this was an excellent, uh, excellent timing, excellent introduction <laughs> to this. You know, you get this this first arc of, of the Simone Bennis Birds of Prey. And just to um, interject real quick, and um, the new movie is going to be coming out. So I think this is also a good time to talk about it, it because it is, yes. we know that, that um, they're that um, they're going to have a new movie. So can, I'm kind of excited. I, I, I'm trying to stay away from any. I don't really know who's in it. I'm trying to stay away from all the spoilers because I just want to watch it with uh, fresh eyes. So, so yeah. The, so you're referring to the Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One <laughs> Harley Quinn. Yeah. What a great title. Oh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> it's, so, it's such a weird <laughs> title for a movie. You wouldn't normally not get that, something like that. But, but it feels like a movie with Harley Quinn needs a title like that. Though, yeah, right? that, that's true. That's very true. <laughs> Um, okay, so I was going to talk a little bit about the movie as well, but it sounds like so. You, do you do you oh, know sorry, the characters? I keep that jumping are, in. No, no, that's fine. Uh, do you know the characters that are in it? Because uh, I, I, I don't want to. If you don't want to know anything about the movie, I don't want to spoil it for you here. Um, I saw a couple of things of who uh, I think got cast, but I just quickly just forgot. Okay, but you can talk about it. It's okay. Okay, I, I'll just mention obviously Harley Quinn's in it. <laughs> um, uh, let's see who else is in this. Um, Oh shoot! Uh, oh, black. There, there will be a black canary. There will be a huntress. Uh, Renee Montoya. Mm-hmm. Oh, and and, Renee. and uh, uh, Cassandra Cain. Uh, Cassandra Cain is also in this. So, um, in this run of Birds of Prey, in the in the comic, it is it is uh, Oracle uh, mm-hmm. uh, Barbara Gordon, uh, Black Canary Dinah Dinah uh, Dinah. I'm blanking on Dinah's last name. I just forgot to. <laughs> uh, okay, moving on then, because I can't. It's not coming to me. And 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 uh, this is also the introduction of Huntress into the Birds of Prey, because before now it's just basically been a duo uh, through the first fifty-five issues or so. And so I, that's one of the things I'm 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 gonna uh, be glad to be talking about because Huntress certainly br- uh, brings a different aesthetic to to the book and to the the relationships of of the characters so uh, i can't wait to talk about that but uh yeah so anyway back to the movie real quick uh this is something that's i guess going to come out next year mm-hmm. uh i won't say anything else uh, more about it but uh because mm-hmm. i don't even think i've seen a, a teaser trailer yet i don't think i did either i just saw like some of the names who's of uh, the actors who are going to be in it like we know margot robbie's going to be in it mm-hmm. I'm actually pretty excited because I like Mary Elizabeth. Uh, Win- How do you say it? Weinstead or Winstead? Winstead. I um, think, yeah. yeah, I really like her a lot. So I'm kind of. I think she would. She's going to make an amazing huntress. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know Black Canary. I'm not uh, not familiar. I know who the actress is, but I'm not familiar with her work. Mm-hmm. I'm just looking real quick. I see that um, Rosie Perez is in it. Yes. Ewan McGregor, Ali Wong. So it looks like a pretty good cast. Yeah, I think uh, so. I don't think there's been a trailer. I don't think they have showed anything yet. Oh, but, um, okay. That, that, uh, that's what I was trying to remember, if, if actually there was a, a trailer. I, I, I tend to try to, like you, not be... I don't want to be spoiled about anything. Yeah. And so I try to avoid that kind of stuff, but... So I do have one question then. So they're not going to have... Um, got Black Canary Hunter. So they're not going to have Oracle? Is that what you were saying? Because it's it Cassandra Cain's so. going to play... Is going to be Batgirl if they go that route? I have questions about that. Uh, that that's that's curious. You know, <laughs> this, I have questions about that with this run that we're going to talk about. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting because I, you know I I I, I doubt they're going to make her be Batgirl, but who knows? Mm-hmm. They're thing they, you know the the whole DC uh, movie universe is in this weird state of flux right now. 
you know, they started off with, with the Snyder vision and then quickly learned that that maybe wasn't working for most people, <laughs> including me. Uh, but, uh, and now they're, they're trying a different approach to these movies. Uh, I will say I, I did a little bit of reading um, about the, the movie, and mm-hmm. it turns out that Margot Robbie has a lot to do with the fact mm-hmm. that this movie is getting made. Yeah. She's been, she's been promoting it, lobbying it with the studio, because uh, I, I, I guess it's been in, in the works since 2015, even before, I Suicide think, Squad? Suicide Squad came out. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah she's really invested in yes. the Harley Quinn character. Uh, she was instrumental in in uh, getting. She she felt that a female director should should be directing uh, this <laughs> movie, and and you know they hired a female director to do it. So yeah, I given now that I know a little bit about the background of it, I'm even more excited to to actually go and watch this movie. And um, do you happen to know who's directing it? Um, oh, Kathy Yan. Yes. Okay. Man, I'm now I'm just. I'm curious if they're going to bring in Oracle, like how that's going to work. Mm-hmm. Like you said, like so many things have are so weird, especially between the TV series and then the movies. Like we have two different flashes. Like now, like now I'm more interested. Now I'm more invested. I'm like, yeah. who's going to be this? And who, oh my gosh, like <laughs> are they going to totally swap them? And you know what I mean? Because yeah. we're so used to it being Barbara Gordon being Oracle. Like, are they going to switch it and it's going to be Cassandra Cain and then Barbara Gordon still gets to be Batgirl here? Or, I don't know, how do they change it? I don't know. Okay, sorry. Now I'm like, we well, just rejuvenated my excitement for the movie again. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out next year. Uh, I don't know. Another year? <laughs> yeah, how, I don't know. Oh, it's scheduled to be really, oh, we don't have to wait very long. It's, it's uh, well, no, we do. It's, I'm think, I don't know what I'm thinking. It's, it's February 7th, 2020 right now for the release. So, so we're like halfway just, there. Yeah, just just a, a little under a year. So, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, so we should we uh, get into the books? Yeah. All right. So, like I said, this is Birds of Prey uh, number fifty six. Uh, it says on the cover here, bold new direction. It all starts here. Oracle and Black Canary fight back, and like I said, by uh, Simone Bennis and and Lee. Uh, primarily, and uh, I'm going to give uh, just a brief synopsis of each issue, and then uh, MJ and I will talk about the the issue and see where this goes. And and uh, MJ, if if you if I if I've forgotten something that you think is really pertinent to the synopsis, please uh, please let us know. Okay. I, I try to be uh, as succinct as possible, just so we get a, a gist of what the issue is about. So, issue 56: uh, the birds attempt to scare this businessman who, uh, whose name is Fisher into not bleeding his company dry and retiring out of the country, uh, which leads him to apparently attempt suicide. Uh, actually, what happens is that he was being blackmailed by these uh, two very interesting characters, uh, the, the villains of the story, uh, Savant and his partner, I think it's pronounced Creote, who, uh, at the end of the issue, they uh, attack Black Canary, who has come uh, to help Fisher, or try to stop him from committing, as, as she and Oracle thought, uh, suicide. Uh, they attack Black Canary, and end up breaking her legs. It's a very violent ending to this issue. And uh, I have to say, just real quick, I really like how uh, Simone and Bennis structured the endings of these issues. They really did a good job of, of giving you like this um, cliffhanger ending, I think, in almost every issue. That just makes you want to dive right into the next, the next, uh, the next issue. And I agree. That's and it's funny that you said that because like every time I ended my notes on each issue, I was like, I you know I said something about I think she got her legs broken, and then we go on to the next issue, and then, you know I had my my next um, my next comment after that. But yeah, that was really good, and I could feel it. I don't know if you did, it, and it was just like one. I feel like it was just like one panel, just when he held the. Um, what was he using a was he using a a, a billy club? Yeah. At that point, just when he put it back, and then that next panel where you see her legs, and I was like, oh. And then immediately I started thinking of uh, Misery. And yes. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, and I just I feel like I almost had a visceral reaction uh-huh. to it. I was like, oh, my gosh. And that's only like two panels. 
So that, yeah, the ending of this issue really had me. I was like, wow, that's pretty good. Well, exactly. The way you just put that vi- that visceral reaction, I felt like that many times reading these issues, um, especially given what Black Canary goes through mm-hmm. uh, while she's being held hostage by uh, Savant and Creo, you know, and mostly Savant. Because uh, he's he's kind of like the, the the brains of the of the operation, mm-hmm. but he's also uh, I'm jumping ahead, and, uh, and you know <laughs> we're not going to go. I don't think we're going to go uh, you know in in uh, linear linear order here. But uh, so apologies to people who might expect that. But <laughs> uh, uh, Savant is just cr- he's kind of crazy, you know. He he, uh, and he but he's interesting. Um, he started out as he wanted to be a superhero. He's like this genius level person, wanted to be a superhero. And we find that this is something we find out down the road, but mm-hmm. uh, in, in these issues, but you know, he, he has an encounter with Batman and that changes everything. And, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that because I'll, I have notes for that later, but <laughs> so what, so what, what's your overall impression of this first issue? So I think, well, I, my first note that I have and. If you've listened to my podcast, a lot of times I go off the cuff, so it's kind of rare that I actually have notes. But um, I felt, which was kind of funny, and I'm not sure, like, if this is, like, how far into um, Gil's career she was in when she started this. Um, at first, I kind of didn't get that feeling. Like, I felt like it was somebody different writing. So um, those first few scenes when when Canary is in the, in the car with uh, Fisher, it didn't feel like a Gail Simone book at first until I got to the second part and then it right away it clicked when I think when um, Oracle and uh, and Canary were talking to each other and I was oh that's that's the you know the tone that I'm used to Mm -hmm. so I don't know if it was just kind of a you know like you know getting used to writing something different or the characters and just getting into because like this Fisher guy I don't think he's you know really anybody that anybody's ever seen before and he won't be seen again so it's not like you know, you're right. You're kind of making up a character, so you don't know how the relationship are really going to be until you start writing more of the character. Mm-hmm. So in the very beginning, that this the first couple of pages, I was kind of like, mm, this doesn't really, you know, seem familiar to me. I guess as a as a fan of her writing, and then I think um, let's see what else did I have in there. So that was one of the things, and so it took me a little bit, uh, I guess, a couple of pages again to say to warm up. I did have a couple of weird issues with the art. Um, some of it was like the face. Uh, sometimes Fisher's face kind of looked like he like got punched in the face, like kind of <laughs> like like putty. Um, yeah. There were some weird, weird anatomical things going on there. Um, I had wrote down there was one particular panel when there, it kind of pans outside of the car, and he's kind of sideways, and he looks like he's a big guy, so it didn't look right that he was sitting that way when he was talking to her. So I was like, well, this, and it looks weird because he had his hands up, and I'm like. Uh, this was kind of like a weird, like now it feels like you're just kind of trying to squeeze them all yeah. in there. So that was kind of a weird thing, but I didn't have too many problems with the art. And I think my favorite, <laughs> just kind of jump ahead. I think my, cause there's a lot of sexy stuff going on in these books. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. That's some of my comments later on. Maybe get a little <laughs> bit sexy, but one of, because I think one of the first things she says is, do you have my hand on my lap or take your hand off my lap or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then, but on, let's see. Um, I was telling Eric earlier, since we're doing the digital comics, uh, page one is considered the cover. So I'm on page six, which I guess would be page five if you have a um, one of the floppies. But the first panel, she has her legs spread and she's got like one leg up, looks like her on her shoulder and looks like her other leg is in her hand. And I was like, wow, I'm like, that's a pretty suggestive um, image right there. But um, yeah. That kind of was, was uh, I guess it was, uh, I felt like that was leading into some of the other things that I think happen kind of later on. Maybe like uh, her personality and um, of, <laughs> of uh, Black Canary, at least. Well, so yeah. I, those are, those, I just wanted to comment on that. It, it's this, this whole story, just generally speaking, is it was a weird mix of um, coming, coming into these characters one and two the creators works them uh, uh the creators work themselves mm-hmm. because you know uh, i can't remember what my first gail simone work was that i got into um it wasn't secret six but that that series is so good 
uh, and, and cemented uh, to me how great Gail Simone's writing is. Um, and I can see... I can see what she did later in, in Secret Six starting here. Mm. And, and, and on top of that, so I just looked this up as you were, as you were talking. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was apparently uh, was her first work for DC after leaving Marvel, where she had worked oh. on Deadpool and Agent X, okay. uh, which I've, I've not read those, either of those works by her. And so she came over to do this book for DC, um, but she's she's such a strong writer that I you know uh, normally someone who's new like that newer anyway especially to these characters to this company um, she's it's apparent you know her skill is is so good uh, her her writing is so strong and now it gets much better as as it goes on goes along mm-hmm. of course but uh, I was really surprised to see how strong it was um, uh, from the get go. And then Ed Bennis's work, I was introduced to in his Justice League of America run, I think. And I remember uh, uh, reading that series and going, wow, this is a art. I mean, the art is nice. Uh, he does a, a pretty good job, generally speaking, but it's a mm-hmm. whole lot of cheesecake. And that's not something I normally care for. Um, and like you, I thought there's a lot of kind of weird perspective things, and, you know, that you were talking about the, the scene in the car. There's the one panel on uh, this is well, it's on page six. Maybe it's the same one you were talking about, but the way that she is using her legs to pin him to the car uh, to, the, yeah. to the other side of the car. I'm like, you know, I'm sure he, a human can do that, but cars aren't that roomy, generally speaking. <laughs> So how is how does this work exactly? So the this entire run of of of, of this of this uh this story there's things like that throughout where I was like where the art basically pulled me out of it cuz I cuz cuz I started thinking about it the the technical aspects of it it's like what how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some there's some weird uh perspective things that were going on there. That's why I felt like it was trying to squeeze too many things into a very small space. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I think that he tells the story in the art really well. Like I mean, like we just said at the very ending, at the very end, at the very end, it was so powerful just from those two little scenes. And I was like, holy moly! You know, there no, there were no words that actually had to be said because you already knew it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a you know, and that's um, I don't think a lot of artists can do that sometimes. Just be able to, and that was one of the things just to throw somebody else in there that I like about um, Joe Isma um, from uh, Morning Glories. Because I always felt like, because it always seemed like, um, I just forgot the the author, uh, Nick um, Spencer. Nick Spencer, thanks. That I felt like he um, he would always let him have a lot of panels with no text, and he would just tell the story with the panels, and that's kind of what I got there. Like, kind of, tw- I felt like towards the the end of most of these issues was, even though there was some uh, dialogue. I felt like he could. T- the artist was able to tell the story without, even if the the text, the letter boxes weren't even there. Like I was getting a lot of, like I, like we both had said, we was getting a lot of visual, uh, visceral reactions to a lot of these things without even having to read any of it. And mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, and that's one of the, um, even though there's some weird technical stuff or like just you know weird perspective stuff, being able to still pull off, you know, those kinds of reactions from the reader, I think is pretty cool. Yeah, it's a poor way of ending that that <laughs> statement, but <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. I I I don't want to don't want to suggest that um, all I have are complaints about Bennis's work because he he is he is a fine penciler, and not only that, um, uh, you know, including the 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 Lee inks. I mean, they, <laughs> together they do a really good job at depicting the images. But uh, I think uh, Bennis does a really good job, at, you know, narratively speaking telling the story panel to panel, page to page. <laughs> and there are some details in here, you know, like you know, the scene that we're talking about in the car, there's all this rain. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, you know, rain in comics is just not done well, I'll, I'll just say. <laughs> but uh, the, I think the I think the artist did a really good job at depicting those scenes in there. And and like I said, you know, the, the there's a lot of, it's mostly just uh, rectangle 
panels, mm-hmm. but Bennis is, you know, not just doing a, a grid like pattern every time. He's 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 mixing it up and allowing the panel to be as large as it needs to be to tell that particular bit of the story. And I and, and there's even a few times where he's he's taken a rectangular shape and put a diagonal across it mm-hmm. to tell, you know, to show two different two different scenes. Um, and it's, it's a great, you know, it's, it reminds me of a swipe in, in a video where you're swiping <laughs> from one, one image to another. I, I, I love, I love the playfulness of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff going on in here. And I, and I'd like, um, I'm kind of going to jump ahead too. I think, um, a lot of the lighting, especially in the later issues is really well done. Oh, and yeah. I, I was like, wow, this looks really, really good. And I've seen, I'm not familiar. This is probably the first time I've actually seen, um, this artist's work, Ben is. So I'm not really familiar with him, but I've seen like high fives color a few times. I'm not really sure who that is, but, um, and like a lot of the lighting in, on these books, I was like, wow, this looks really, really good. And it's, and, and again, it's, a, um, I think it plays well to the scenes and really makes a lot of some of the stuff like pop out, like one of the fight scenes that we'll see later in one of the later issues with Huntress. I really like the, um, there's like this whole light coming source coming from one way. And then you have a little bit of a shadow on the other. And I think it really like popped out Mm -hmm. the, you know, the characters, which I thought was really good too. Yeah. When you were talking about the, the light stuff, there must be, it must be in a later issue, but uh, just the lighting, you know, uh, I think it was a car light or something. The way, the way the color art, uh, the color artist uh, showed it was just, I, really good and then compare it to what they show here in the first issue and it's a little different so they even the color artist i think was was um doing a better job in later issues Mm -hmm. yeah i think everybody uh, you can tell you can see the progression and only six issues you know of everybody on on this um this little story arc and i was like wow this it's pretty cool it's nice to see like you know that kind of growth you know, so I was like, it, it, sometimes you see it over a longer span of time, but to see it in sort of a condensed amount of time, I was really, really impressed by it. Yes, exactly. I was going to say the same thing and and f- have it be so good in just six issues. Mm-hmm. This is just a, an impressive piece of work. I, you know, I imagine that this, I, I don't know this for sure, but I, I'm assuming that uh, this is the first time that Simone and Bennis worked together and they really just hit it out of the park. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm really kind of flabbergasted at how well they did mm-hmm. uh, r- starting out on this established series. I mean, this is issue 56 of a series. That's we don't get a whole lot of issue 56s anymore uh, with <laughs> with with a creative team. Uh, so it's yeah, I'm I'm very impressed. Uh, and uh, the only thing I'll say about about that collaboration is. You were talking before about how some of the panels really don't have uh, either dialogue or 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 um, uh, narrative boxes, uh-huh. but other pages have a ton of dialogue. But uh, it doesn't seem like it's overpowering the the visuals of the mm-hmm. story, which I thought was a great balance that that uh, Simone and Bennis and Lee. Wait, which one? Which one's the letter? Uh, sorry, John Workman. <laughs> uh, uh, Lee too, but um, but how how they all how they balance that all out is it, yeah, it doesn't feel it. overpowered with with all this dialogue. So yeah, very impressive work. And so I do have one question: Do does is Canary's um, thought bubbles are they always on like a printed paper? Is that how, is that something that always happens, oh, or does that just the... happen? With her character, oh, is that like, something like a, like a diary type thing? Yeah, is it always like that? I, I you know, are, are you t- are you asking historically? Has she has she always been yeah, doing that? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I Just, honestly don't know. Um, I think that's something. I see that a lot in the 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 Bat universe mm-hmm. of titles. You know, they they started doing that with Batman years and years ago. Uh, I think it's just a um, a short a, a writer's shorthand of getting into the thoughts without actually showing thought bubbles anymore because no one shows <laughs> thought bubbles anymore well because like hers are like that but then when you see later on savant his thought bubbles are different yes like his more his are more traditional so that's why i was wondering if this, if this kind of being like a torn piece of paper was just kind of specific for her character because i don't think i don't think we had any thought bubbles really for huntress or oracle either 
So it was just um, Savant and her, I think, that had mm. throughout this run or this story arc that had thought bubbles and his weren't like that. So that's why I wondered, because I have noticed that for some other characters before, they always tend to use the same kind of thought bubble for them yeah. in other in other books I have seen. But so that's why I was wondering if this was just, you know, uh, something that was particular to her character or not. Huh. Well, now I'm going to have to keep an eye on that as we go through the later <laughs> issues, because I, I honestly didn't really notice. I mean, I, I obviously I saw I saw their their thoughts being transmitted in, in some way. But I yeah I didn't think of it in terms of a comparison like that. I I think we had other I think maybe we even had Oracle's thoughts down, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just misremembering it. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we'll come maybe. And I do like how they did, uh, like, when she gets, is, uh, did they do it in this issue? When, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. When, um, let me see. Oh, this, 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 this. Sorry, I'm trying to jump forward. When, she, well, first when she kind of lost her voice and then they kind of, they um, broke up her bubble into like oh, little, mm-hmm. what is that called? I forgot. Um, but now I notice that they look like they did that when she was on the phone too. So I guess anytime she whispered, they would do that. So I thought that was kind of cool because I haven't seen whispering like that before. Yeah. I yeah. think I've either seen it either like be smaller or like italicized or something different like with the actual text. But this was kind of, I think, the first time I've seen it with um, the, the bubble like that, like dotted. Yeah. For me. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I mean, John Work. I almost did. It. Yeah. John Workman. <laughs> <laughs> is, is doing a really good job here. We, I normally don't talk a lot about the the letters in in the stuff that I, that I review, but yeah, he. It's obvious that he he had a, a lot invested in trying to tell you know help tell that tell the story. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. I think with the lettering. Yeah. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to bring up in here. But yeah, so that was one of the things too. When I going back to the the that one frame that I was saying that kind of little, looked a little bit suggestive, and I was wondering because I know that since Gil Simone has written like you know Red Sonia and some other books that are kind of like kind of I think like sexy books too, mm-hmm. what could be considered sexy book. I wonder like how much input she had into that, or she thought, oh that's funny, yeah, keep that in there, or if that was just like all him, you know? Because yeah. sometimes I wonder, you know, when they're doing these things, I'm like, how much is the artist kind of having, you know, their own fun and, or how much input is the writer having with some of these panels? So some of these other things like that, because I felt like later on when we get um, kind of silly stuff, she's writing it, you know? So I'm like, Oh, maybe, you know, she was like, Hey, this is kind of cheeky. I like this, do this, you know, or whatever. So it was just kind of, that's why I like, just agreeing again that I think they had a good, it seems like they really made a good pairing as a writer and artist in mm-hmm. this, I have I have uh, over the years you know, reading interviews uh, about various things, but I I, I, I recall uh, Simone being very complimentary to to Ed Bennis's work, mm-hmm. um, and it seemed like they, they had a good working relationship as as far as I know. So yeah, it, it's that's always one of the, the questions I always have about any comic that I'm reading is what is the relationship between the writer and artists. Uh, how much do they collaborate? Um, yeah, it 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 seems it seems like they did. It seems I, I get this the the feeling that they really, really were, well. They were really invested in their run working, and so they really put time and, and effort into into um, crafting a really good story that only they could tell. I I, I think they did a really good job here. Generally, yeah, speaking. me too. Me too. I agree. One of the things I, I really love about this issue, though, is when Dinah and Babs, Oracle, um, get together towards the end of the issue. And they're just they're just two people, two women sitting around talking about uh, about what what the case that they're working with this Fisher guy. And um, more importantly, just about how they're how they're feeling about their lives and and all the stuff that goes on with the superhero stuff, you know, layered on top of all that. Mm-hmm. And I find uh, a lot of comics I read, you know, I'll just be blunt, you know, written by guys. I don't feel like they, they are, they have the, the female voice down in the best way. Always. I think they they always have a harder time writing friendships 
because they don't yes. know. There you go. You know, they're not familiar with female friendships. They're not the same as male friendships. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because that, that, that's exactly that's that's really what I meant to say. So thank you for <laughs> for for clarifying that because that is what I'm responding to is is this relationship, this friendship, this part. It's a partnership. It's mm-hmm. you know, Oracle is she's she's uh, you know, like I said, I've not read this this series. I don't know what came before, uh, how these two were were portrayed, but you kind of get a sense of it because uh, I don't know if it's this issue or or, or coming up, but. But Oracle talks about, you know, when they, when, or actually both of them at some point, they both talk about when they first started, you know, they, uh, Oracle wanted to, uh, use Black Canary to, to do certain things. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, Black Canary is her field agent and there is that dynamic of, of, you know, you know, she's kind of the pseudo boss Oracle is, I mean, and Black Canary is, is the field agent doing the bidding of, of the, the base um, commander type thing. <laughs> but obviously in this issue, uh, they have, and actually I, I'm going to go back to that just real quick. I, I think for a time, I could be wrong about this. Cause like I said, I haven't read it. I think for a time, these characters didn't even, hadn't even met mm. while they were working together. Oh, wow. Despite, despite the fact they were working together, obviously they've, they've, they've met so far here. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, you know, if any of the listeners, who know better and I'm wrong, please let me know. But, um, uh, they have, they obviously have a relationship, personal relationship, one-on-one relationship now. And, and that scene, you know, this might be to some people might just be like, why are we, why are we getting this scene here? But that scene where, uh, Dinah's brought dinner home yeah, (laughs) and, and, you know, they're just talking about whatever. And suddenly, uh, uh, Oracle, she's like, Dinah, Dinah. (laughs) And she says, you've got to try the shrimp. <laughs> and and Dinah great. tries it and literally falls down <laughs> from how good it is. You know, it's such a comedic little moment. But, and, and uh, you know, perhaps a bit over the top because who, who's going who's gonna <laughs> to fall down from just eating shrimp? But, boy, it's got to be really good shrimp, right? <laughs> but it just, it just really shows this, the, the, the comfort they have with each other, mm-hmm. the, the friendship that, that they have. I, I just... I, that is the the most interesting thing about this first issue as I read it uh, read it through the first time and the three or four times I've read it since. Mm-hmm. I just keep coming back to how much these women get along and uh, compliment each other. I, I, I just, I, I love it. <laughs> and I think it's, and it's a big, and one of the things too, that, which I like that Dinah uh, tells to her or says to her, where she kind of um, makes a says something about the, the what is it the bat family or whatever, and she brings that up. But I think and what I which I think is kind of funny is a lot of you don't see. Um, oh man, I'm gonna lose my point. Um, <laughs> what I was gonna say was you don't um, you don't see that there's always secrets. Like whenever the guys are together, or or even you know, or other guys and girls, whatever. Um, some of the characters are together. There's always all these secrets behind them, you know? Mm-hmm. You, so you don't feel like they actually, like, when they're, even though they're friends, you always know that there's someone's hiding something. And right here, I feel like it's actually a genuine, like, friendship. Yeah. Like, there's nothing really, even though there probably is secrets, but it doesn't feel like there's anything between them. Like, they actually do feel like they're friends and have a trust for each other, you know? Whereas, and that's why I felt like when she kind of made that point about the Bat family, it, it's like, there always is a secret, right? Batman is always keeping things from people, um, not just the Bat family. He's always keeping things from Superman and Wonder Woman. You know, he's always keeping things from people. And there's always these secrets and stuff like that. And right here, it, you just see these two girls that look like they have, you know, nothing to hide from each other. I mean, you know, she's fall, like you said, she falls off of her seat and not embarrassed or anything like that. You know, it's just, just these two girls hanging out, talking, bring each other dinner or whatever. And it just feels like a genuine friendship, mm-hmm. which is kind of nice. It doesn't feel like it's forced or anything like that. And I think that's one of the things that I think that she, that Gil Simone does really well too. And that's when she, um, one of the things that, um, I felt like that she also did when she did, uh, ba- uh, Batgirl was her relationships with other people. They yeah. felt like really genuine. I think that's a hallmark of, of Simone's work is that she really focuses on relationships as opposed to what the, the adventure de jour mm-hmm. for the character. Yeah. And it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just that they have this really good friendship. There's, there's a scene on, 
our digital page 12, where they're just getting started talking after the, after Dinah brings dinner. And uh, Dinah says, uh, surely the irony of knowing everyone, and speaking of secrets, uh, <laughs> surely of knowing everyone's dirty laundry while keeping too, uh, keeping so many, sorry, while keeping so many secrets of your own hasn't escaped you. Uh, does it ever bother you uh, what we do? Do you ever wonder if their right to privacy outweighs our right to know? And as she says that, we get this flashback panel to where uh, Dinah was was um, uh, dealing with Fisher. And mm-hmm. you can, this is, there's a bit of division here that's not being said to b- between them. As, as any friends who have... Um, uh, disagreements or, mm-hmm. or you know, uh, uh, something stronger than disagreement, um, uh, a real problem with, with their friend, you know, mm-hmm. they're not going to immediately, in a soap opera fashion, just uh, 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 declare this problem to, to the other person, right? So this yeah. is something that is starting to bother Dinah and will have um, repercussions down the road. Yeah, like a slow build. Yes, yes. Yeah, I really, I, I just, I really dig those last, basically the last half of this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same too. Um, and then the end. So, I, I, it just, unless there's something else you want to touch on, this might be a good, uh, good time to move to the next issue. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and we already talked about how how the issue ends. But uh, the the the, uh, the whole suicide note thing causes Dinah to go uh, go to Fisher's play or where Fisher is. And that's where they, uh, that's where she encounters uh, Savant and Creout, and like I said, they're they're bad dudes. Um, very, you know, Cre- uh, Creout's like this huge Hulk-like looking guy. You know, he's 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 made he's he's mostly muscle, <laughs> um, like you know, superhuman level of, of muscle. And Creout, like I said, is he, he started out as a superhero and and. Um, uh, genius level guy so you might be able to guess where what kind of character he might be like but then yeah you get that scene where he uh, uh wax dinah's leg you know and you, the 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 sound effect is you know crack and but it's shown in in silhouette and uh the the final panel on that page is is dinah tears of pain not fear, but I think pain, you know, just mm-hmm. she can't help but but uh, cry a little bit because it hurts so damn much. And uh, uh, the issue ends, and this is one of the first cliffhanger we get where Savant messages Oracle and saying, we have your partner, list of demands to follow. And that, that reaction of, of, of Barbara's here is... is just well done, I think. Mm-hmm. L- you know, a little, little dramatic, uh, melodramatic, <laughs> but, you know, that's comics. <laughs> Yeah, that's good stuff right there at the end. Do you? Uh, this is this is a total total aside, but in that on the the top there of that last page, uh, Babs is looking at the screen of people because she's talking about you're going to talking uh, to Dinah um, <laughs> about you're going to get back up, whether you like it or not, and we see six people on this screen, and I recognize all but I think one, maybe two. Like the the blonde uh, woman in the lower right, do you recognize who that is? I think that's Power Girl, but I'm not that's, sure. Yeah, that's who I think that is too. Okay, and then the middle the middle person up there uh, on the top, that's that looks like Green Lantern. That looks that looks like um, uh, 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 Kyle. Oh, oh okay. You, yeah, I wasn't sure, that, that but now that you else? say that. Because it almost looks like Tim Drake Robin, but he's it's he's dressed in green. On the the top. Yeah. Oh oh, I thought you meant the deceased one. The deceased one, I didn't know who that was. Um, no, I thought that was Robin also, but it, maybe it could be a. Maybe it's a coloring mistake then. Maybe. But but the other was of course our our. Um, uh, uh, Raven Night- Nightwing. Nightwing. I th- is I th- I thought that was spoiler. Underneath oh. Nightwing there. Is it? Oh, I thought that was Raven. That's the only character I know that looks like that with a pointy hood. And then and then Huntress is, is shown here. So we get we get a little foreshadowing here. And that is that's it's kind of funny because I was laugh sorry, I was I was kind of laughing at that panel too because I was like exactly that's kind of exactly how when Batman's looking for somebody, it comes up exactly like that. Yeah. There's so many little callbacks to um 
like like it's like they had to and this was one of my comments on another on the another on the one of the other books i'm like it's like you had to throw in batman has to show up like <laughs> you know in the book yeah. even though he's not even part of the book yes well but I'll, I'll make a i have a, a kind of a larger comment on that i think later on one of the other books later on okay okay <laughs> well you know and it is it technically speaking this is a bat book and you know it's within the bat family it even has yeah. on the covers you have a little a little um pictogram of of batman's head so just just so you know hey this is a batman book make sure you pick it up even mm-hmm. though you you don't need that <laughs> it's not necessary for this work for sure yeah, uh so- should we go to the next issue yeah so uh issue 57 Return of the Huntress, and uh, boy, Huntress makes a big splash on the cover there, breaking through a window. Uh, I, I, I dig that that cover. I don't dig Huntress's costume. I'll talk about that later. <laughs> it's always been a problem of mine. But uh, uh, issue fifty-seven, Savant attempts to gain information from, uh, uh, sorry, about Oracle from the captured and injured Canary. Uh, we find that uh, both of her legs are in casts, uh, so presumably, presumably they're both broken. Um, uh, and, uh, this issue shows just how psychotic he really is. Uh, Barbara impresses Savant, however, with her extemporaneous poetry, which I, I we're going to have to talk about that. I, I, I just, I really dug that. Uh, afterwards, uh, Barbara's, uh, Barbara calls Huntress to enlist her aid, but Huntress is working a kidnapping case first. Uh, and then the issue ends with Canary working on an escape plan. So I had some confusion on some of these issues where the cover, and I don't know if this is a digital thing, because you know how sometimes like weird, well, I don't know if you know that, but sometimes there's like weird blips when they add something digitally. Oh, yeah. Um, that, you know, compared to the the floppies. But mm-hmm. so this is called Return of the Huntress. But then later on, they called it, oh, no, wait, maybe it was a different one. Because this is like mines. And that's that's what this, this, um story arc was right Mm -hmm. okay maybe it was a different oh no no i'm sorry no it was at it's the end of this one i see i jumped ahead at the end of this one it calls the next episode something next issue something and then when you get to the next issue it's called something else so i kind of got confused a little bit yeah i noticed that too yeah so i didn't know if that was if that's something that like got lost in translation making it digitally or if that's how it was in the books and then they just changed their mind once they got to the next issue or what happened there? Yeah, I I noticed that. Yeah, it's a weird thing. I I I tend to think it's probably that's how it was in the in the original publications, <laughs> but you know, given given the the trade mentality, they were they really try to promote the 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 arc story title over anything else. Yeah. But yeah, it says Return of the Huntress. Um, you know, that's probably just a marketing thing as as opposed to anything else. Oh, just kind of like an ad that she's. That this is the one that she's going to be in. Yeah, yeah. That's, okay, that's how I took it anyway. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. Uh, so on the on the very first page of this issue, we get uh, this is this is what I was talking about earlier. We get uh, Savant. He's he's had an encounter with Black Canary, which caused causes him to have to stitch his own eyebrow up. Uh, <laughs> Which you know, I, I, I just dig that. Even though she, we find out the canary's handcuffed to a bed and she has broken legs, she's still able to cause some injury to this this psychotic guy. Because as he's doing this, he see, he sees Batman in in the mirror, and uh, you know, Batman says, "You're not morally equipped for this job. Your presence will not be tolerated." And we'll 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 get more of that later. But but more importantly, he, uh, Savant points at points at the mirror and says, "You're not." I'm 90% certain that you're not actually here at this time. <laughs> and Creote comes into the room and says, we are alone, Mr. Savant. <laughs> well, that's good news. <laughs> and so, you know, we now know this guy, not only is he a threat, but he's a crazy threat. Yeah. He's got some, something going on with him. Yeah. So, um, I think one of my, well, one of my first notes on here was, I thought the I aming between, uh, Oracle and him was pretty funny. And so I might've jumped, to hit him okay. that but that was the first thing that was the first thing that I wrote that stood out to me it seems so weird like how they just like they're kind of like there's how do you say like good guy bad guy but they're like 
<laughs> I am in each other. <laughs> I was like, what a weird way to like communicate to each other. Yeah, it, it, well, <laughs> so this is 2003 that this is coming out. So I don't know. Was it's hard? To, it's hard to remember now. Was 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 instant messaging? Yeah, I mean, it, there was instant messaging yeah. around that time, but I, I wonder how how prevalent it was uh, to to the larger audience. I guess. Because I guess it just it just seemed funny because it was they we saw like an interchange or an, or an, ex, an interchange an exchange in the first issue where she thought it was Fisher but it was really him but now they're messaging each other again then he calls her so it just seems so funny that they're going having this exchange over and you know you can't tell usually when you're messaging somebody how they're feeling or what their emotions are generally so it was just kind of funny to me when they're talking to each other. And then all of a sudden, then you know, then he calls her. So I was like, "Why didn't you just call her at the beginning?" Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just like he has like these weird like. I guess it was part of his game, yeah. you know, that he was playing with her. But it was just kind of funny because then she's playing along with it too. Yeah. So I, they had a lot of good little weird like, exchanges, I think. And 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 just kind of bordering on com- on on comedy, these kind of comedic interactions. Yeah. You know, which, again, that you know. Uh, um, as you read Simone's work, you know, in total, that's kind of her style. Um, and so it was nice to see this as, you know, a, a first time DC work. I recognize that in, in this, um, based on what I've read of her, her later stuff. So that, that, that's a nice continuity for the creator that I enjoyed. I think she has a, she does a good balance of being able to take a serious scene or a dark scene and then adding levity to it. Yes. And that's usually what you want, especially like in a movie that's really super dark. That's the, you know, you always want that type of levity to kind of ease some of the tension yes. and then build it back up again. And mm-hmm. I think that she does that really, really well. Mm-hmm. And just real quick, one of my other first notes was I wasn't sure if I missed that panel, the crack panel, I guess, when I was reading it. So I wasn't sure that she, um, that her legs were broken. I don't know how I missed that ah, panel. Okay. So that's why in my mind in the second one where she's crying, I was like, I saw that one. So then when I, when we got to this page, I thought it was her boots. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it wasn't until later in the issue, I was like, oh, her, both her, her legs were broken. Here I was, I thought she was just chilling in her boots. There was some stuff that I was like, oh, there's a, continu- there's a continuity issue here. But then it was rectified on the next one and answered. And I'm like, never mind this. Me just, <laughs> I just will wait and see how it works out. <laughs> well, and, you know, that, that also goes to how wonky Savant is. Because, yes, he, you know, uh, psychotic is the word that keeps coming to mind, but uh, meth- I, I'm going to say methodical. I don't think that's the right word that I want either. But, you know, he ver- coldly, he very coldly and calculatingly breaks her legs, but then he casts, he casts them. them. Yeah. That's so weird. Yeah. he He's a weird guy. You know, he, when, he, <laughs> when he comes into the room and we see that first full page shot of Dinah uh, handcuffed, like I said, handcuffed and broken legs. Her, her legs are tied down too. She's on top of the bed and he comes in and says, hello, beloved hungry. <laughs> no, he's just, <laughs> he's weird. <laughs> oh, and, and, and speaking of continuity, this, I just noticed this last night, MJ, when I was rereading the issues, mm-hmm. um, uh, I, I think I, maybe I'm, I'm misreading this, but, uh, his that cut that I mentioned is actually over his right eye, but in the very first scene where we see that he has the cut, it's over his left eye. But and so I'm like, oh, continuity error, but you know, no big deal. <laughs> but then the rest of the issue, I'm looking for that. No, you're right. I'm looking at it because he's first he's looking in the mirror. Mm-hmm. It's on so from the mirror, it's on the left side because it's a mirror. And then when he's talking to. When he's when the mirror is behind him and he's talking to it, it's still on his left side. Yeah. Does that make sense? Unless he's looking at well, no, I don't no, know. He's, he's Unless look, he's looking away at that point. Right. So so the, now so it's now still it's on, on the, the left right side. And then yeah, now when he comes in here, it's on the right side. Yeah. <laughs> and th- there's there's actually another one that I'm going to talk about later. That's uh, an artistic con- uh, continuity error, but. <laughs> It's not That's the funny. thing to focus on, I know, but yeah, but but still, it's it's you know it's those little things that kind of draw me out sometimes, just artistically, but um, not a big deal, really. Yeah, just, that, just, like that one I didn't out. notice. It was funny. Yeah, so it was funny that you had said that. 
But yeah, we we learn that that Savant really is after Oracle. Somehow he's learned about Oracle. Uh, he's he's uh, engineered this entire scenario with Fisher to lure them in. Somehow he knew, and this is one of the things that bugged me because we don't ever find out. And it maybe doesn't matter. You know, it's really kind of like the MacGuffin of the story. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's it's it, it's just a, a means to an end. But um, uh, he 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 wants he wants Oracle. He wants something very specific from Oracle. We'll find out what that is later. But um, uh, this is uh, oh yeah, this is the this is the uh, the poem thing that I mentioned in the synopsis. So he as they're talking, you know, when like you say, first text and then call. Um, uh, Savant's trying to be he's trying to play this cat and mouse game where he fancies himself the cat and so he's just he likes to play with his food type of thing mm. uh, which you know again underlying that that just that creepy nature of him but there's the scene where he's actually talking to her he goes into what looks like a, a well-crafted um, gym in this, in this dilapidated <laughs> house that they're they're in right now but he's he's doing some sort of gymnastics thing on a bar but as he's talking to her, but he's like, um, uh, write me a quatrain, amuse me. And immediately Barbara, you know, because she's a genius too, immediately says, and I'm not saying this right because I, uh, you know, I'm not a poet, but you had better not try to deceive me, you, you quivering cowardly swine. And if you hurt my partner, believe me, I promise I'll rip out your spine. <laughs> And and that shot there of and when she says that last part, he's up on the bars there, and that look on his face, it's almost like he's scared. Or I don't know. I, I was gonna when he's upside down. Yeah, when he's upside down, yeah. I was gonna ask you what you thought. It's either scared or he's impressed. Like he can't believe that she's that good. Yeah, that she's that quick. Yes. And and of course then he laughs about it, but there's a couple of times in the run of the story where he just the looks look on his face is is like he is concerned. Uh, maybe that's a better way to put it. He's concerned about this this thing, uh, not scared necessarily, but but concerned. So I I dig how how the the storytellers are depicting this character. He's not just some crazy evil person. He is yes, he's crazy, but there's. There's something more about him that, that's, that's, you know, he's not two-dimensional, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and I think maybe with the whole thing with Babs twos is that he kind of, like, heard the myth, but now he's seeing it firsthand. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so, like, he knew, he knew a little bit about her, but he doesn't know what he, what did he say that he didn't know what she looked like? But now he's starting to kind of get, like, a taste of her that she's, you know, what he heard about her was, is, was not, you know, an exaggeration. You know, so now it, he's seeing that, yes, yeah, this is a, a formidable uh, person that he's up against. And is it is it this issue where he, Savant, is talking later with Dinah and I'm trying to find that real quick? Or maybe it was in the next issue. Yeah, I think it's the next issue. Oh, no. Yep. Next issue. We'll, we'll come back. I'll come back to that. It's okay. some character moment that I thought was neat. So. Well, not neat. Creepy. Again, I'm going to say creepy a lot <laughs> in regards to Savant here in this story. But, um, and and then uh, I'll I'll just jump to the introduction of Huntress. The first time we get to see her, besides the cover, uh, is she's she's on this uh, um, uh, kidnapping case that she's working, and we see her uh, hanging upside down uh, with uh, these binoculars, Huntress binoculars. Uh, sc- scoping out this place, but this is the this is the era of Huntress. Um, I, I was going to talk about. The, I, I warned you. I was going to talk about this. The era of Huntress's costume, where she had the belly window and um, the shorts. And <laughs> I know it, you know to it looks nice to a certain segment of the reading populace, but f- just from my perspective. What a dumb choice. I mean, and <laughs> but what's funny is they do address this down the road. The characters actually address it, which is yeah. nice. But just the idea of, of a, a non-powered uh, vigilante going around exposing that much flesh is just, I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I'm getting really nerdy with this one, but <laughs> it's just so dumb. And no, I'm, I've always had issues. Sorry. I always have issues with um, 
some of the women's uh, uniforms because I'm like they need to be functional and if you're you're exposing very vital parts of your body exactly that if you're attacked or stabbed or whatever there could be fatal <laughs> you know yeah. you have your stomach right there they could do anything and there's like no kind of blockage um even the even the thigh highs i'm thinking you know your femoral arteries right there right someone can stab you there there's no protection at all and so um yeah i was thinking the same thing as i was i was watching this because i always have a problem with th- these costumes have to be functional they're supposed to be protecting them from <laughs> <laughs> from battle basically yeah. <laughs> you know but yeah i did like how they did bring that up earlier so it's kind of nice because it's like okay we know this is a bit ridiculous and we are going to say we are going to mention it yes I, and i i kind of think that was i want to think that that was simone doing that putting that interjecting that into the into the narrative yeah me too but what i i, <laughs> well, I guess what i don't know is is this look of hers was this where it was introduced i don't know that uh, I, I don't know either but i feel like if she brought it up I feel like she had to have had this costume prior, no? Prior to it, yeah. That, that yeah, makes and sense. but that and but that's why she's addressing it because maybe they were not able to maybe convince the powers that be to change her costume. Yeah. So they're like, well, we can't change her costume, so we're going to address that it's a little bit ridiculous. That, <laughs> so that way, the readers know we <laughs> don't think this costume's cool, yeah. but somebody else does. <laughs> That's how I took it. I, as. I like that. that that's a, that's a perfect expo- explanation for that. Yeah. Um, th- then we get a, bu- a bunch of pages with uh, mostly with Huntress dealing with this kidnapping situation while she's on the phone with with Oracle. But that whole the whole reason for Huntress being here, I I just love that scene where because she's she like I said she's working a kidnapping case and she's doing it. Uh, I mean, Barbara says that's Batman's case, but Huntress immediately says he doesn't go out during the day, and so this is this is a day scene, and and I always like that about Huntress. She's she doesn't give a damn about mm-hmm. the strictures and rules that Batman has, or the limitations of his method. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, despite that, um, not despite that, uh, regardless of the the. Uh, uh, her rejection of that uh, mindset, I guess, you know, what what's underneath Helena Ber- uh, Bertinelli is she cares a lot, which is why she does this. And that's that I think that's really evidenced in this scene where she's rescuing this kidnapped baby. And she, you know, uh, just that scene where she's not even sure the baby's breathing because it's mm-hmm. in, it's in a, uh, a, a drawer. A drawer. Uh, 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 a chest of drawers here and the baby's just laying there in this in this drawer with just a diaper on it looks like and she's she's really concerned that because she's she's not sure that he's breathing but he is and there's relief there and then all of and what i love about the next couple of pages is that her focus is totally <laughs> on the baby mm-hmm. but she's also i mean she's still aware she's still you know huntress and she gets attacked but then you don't even see it. You all we hear is the the sound effect over the speakers that that uh, Barbara's listening to, <laughs> and we know that she took care of one of her assailants. But <laughs> all all her all of her focus is on that baby. I just thought that was a really lovely scene. And I think right before that, she was saying she's the bad one or exactly, something. So yes. then you hear you then she's here all, oh, you know, with the, cuddling the baby uh-huh. and like just like you said. So it was kind of funny. You wouldn't see Batman cuddling a baby like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on on our page twenty, uh, MJ, this is the first reference to to um, what happened to Dinah before in the Longbow Hunters story about her being captured and tortured, and that will come back um, uh, dealing with Dinah or Dinah dealing with that directly as well. And I think in the next issue. Okay, so here's where this here's my question number one for you now. Where she says, then I don't want the first face she sees to be a man wearing a bat mask. Mm -hmm. So can you give me a little bit of background then on that? Because I'm not familiar with that. Actually, I'm not all that certain what that meant either. Because so the the thing that they're referencing, like I said, is is from the Longbow Hunters. Mm -hmm. And Batman had nothing to do with that. So I feel like something must have gone down between her and Batman. Because I think in Mm -hmm. issue one, she even kind of said something about a Batman, like they had some sort of altercation or something. So that's why 
I was, I, this was one of my questions that I wanted to ask you. Cause I'm like, what, you know, what happened, especially with the panel prior to that? I, I, I took it to mean possibly two things. One, you know, she's being held by two men mm-hmm. and then to be rescued by a man, mm-hmm. um, you know, proving in some way to somebody that she's not capable enough on her own mm-hmm. that, that, uh, Barbara is concerned about that. Um, because well, in, go ahead. Was Batman the one that rescued her? No. Or, or did she rescue herself? In, in, in the, the long, long run? No, uh-huh. uh, that was, that was Green Arrow coming in. Actually, it was Green Arrow and, uh, another character whose name, and that's, it was, it was a female archer. I don't, I'm not familiar enough with Green Arrow's backstory to know who that character was um but it was a character that uh an archer character that would show up throughout the years with with these with uh, black canary and, mm-hmm. and green arrow i believe okay. um but it was it was mostly ollie showing up rescuing his his girlfriend so mm-hmm. so there's that and i and I, I think you're right i think maybe there's something going on about uh between the either the the birds of prey themselves and mm-hmm. Batman, or maybe specifically Dinah. But, yeah, you know, something that we've probably mentioned on a prior run. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, Dinah is, has become, in the DC universe over the years, she's been one of the premier fighters. Uh, and to be, I guess, to be have to be rescued by Batman, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not entirely sure of that, but but it's but it's interesting that when, when Dinah, <laughs> sorry, when Bab says this, <laughs> Uh, you know, about a man wearing a bat mask, mm-hmm. this, the, the, what we see is Huntress and we already know that she and Batman don't see eye to eye. So I thought that was a nice layering of these two ideas. Or maybe it's, maybe it's not really about in that scene between these two women. Maybe it's not about Dinah at all, but about their relationship, Babs and Huntress relationship with Batman. Ooh. You know what I mean? So she's making that comment, and bo- that's why both of them. And so this is something that they both can agree on. So then this is a, I guess, a, a building block to their relationship mm. because they both have these issues with the same type of issue with Batman. Yeah, v- yeah, very good. That 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 totally makes a lot of sense. I mean, she does. That just came the next, to me right now. <laughs> the, next pan- the next panel, uh, Hunter says, "I understand." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, that that makes a, whole, a lot of sense. We're discovering new things as we speak. Yeah, I know. That's that's the one thing that I love about, <laughs> about you know, I, I mostly do a, a solo show when I talk about comics, but when I have guests on, it helps illuminate things I'd never thought of, so I love it. Mm-hmm. Trying to see what else I wrote on. Anything else that popped out at you? Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah. The only thing I, I think... Yeah. So uh, one of the things I wanted to to touch on was you know or the question i had when i read this issue was um why bring huntress onto the team like like i said we've had 55 well 56 issues now Mm -hmm. of birds of prey featuring oracle and black canary so why bring on huntress and so i was i was just curious you know was that simone's idea did the did uh, dc want to mix it up a little bit you know so i was just looking for anything that would would uh, let me know anything about why this decision was made yeah, and I don't think I've ever seen anything because I know that Gil really loves Black Canary. So I could see if it was the opposite, mm-hmm. you know, way of that's why she would bring her in. But I'm not sure. I don't think just from my little, you know, perusings, I don't know if I've heard anything about why bringing in Huntress here. I did find uh, this. There was. Um... Or do you think it could be because of the show? Since there was, wasn't there all three of them? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly, I'm sorry. I'm, thank you for reminding me that, that was, that, that's why I was, that's why I was talking about that connection, that timeline Mm -hmm. connection before Mm I thought maybe that's, yeah, that could very well be, I couldn't find anything specifically to that. What I did find was a quote from, from Gail about, um, interview she did with, uh, uh, the trades.com, but she says this, um, uh, commenting on the new lineup, saying that each character provided a foil for the two others. So she wanted this triumvirate character situation. In this case, Babs and Dinah respect each other tremendously, and each is capable of great things the other is not. Huntress, I see Helena as someone who is not alone or completely by choice. 
Dinah is so accepting and so open that Helena sees an opportunity opportunity to be part of something without having to force her way in. There's friction because once Helena puts the mask on, she's really not very good at fitting in, but she likes that they're giving her a chance. There, there was more that she said in this article, but that was, that was the pertinent part about Huntress. So. Hmm. Maybe that was just something that she wanted to delve into, mm-hmm. bringing, just kind of adding another layer to this already, an, another friendship that was already happening, and then just bringing in somebody else who maybe needs to have um, a, um, some people that she can turn to because mm-hmm. she doesn't have anybody. Well, and, and like we said in the in the, the previous issue, that that friendship between Dinah and and Barbara is, is so palpable mm-hmm. that what do you so what do you where do you go with that? What do you do with that? Well, you you know you, you do with a lot, what a lot of storytellers do. You bring in this other thing, this other element that disrupts that or changes it in a way so that you can tell even even more dynamic stories. The more characters you have, the more opportunity you have with that. So, I, good choice. I think. Yeah. Um, the issue does end, I'll just mention real quick, the issue does end with Dinah. You know, so we, we just had this conversation between Barbara and Huntress about how this may be affecting Dinah in a, in a, mm-hmm. in a, you know, a, um, um, a psychological way. Mm-hmm. And then we get to the last page and we discover, you know, maybe Barbara has this vision of Dinah, but Dinah certainly isn't feeling this way. Yeah. <laughs> she is planning her escape and she's about ready to execute that. And the look on her face is not one of fear or hesitance. It is of determination. Yeah. I really enjoyed this whole like inner monologue thing that was going on here. I have, that's like my last note on this one. Um, I liked how she kind of was like, we knew what she was going to do and she was like describing it and she's like prepping herself. Cause she knew, you know, how to do this. It's going to hurt. I'm going to, you know, but she's like, okay, I don't have any, I'm going to have three broken limbs. <laughs> you know? So I was just, I just kind of like how she was like pumping herself up, but she wasn't going to be a victim. That's yes. the, And that's, I think like we were saying, that was kind of the contrast where Babs was afraid that she was, that's kind of how she was going to be. But you know, Canary was writing her own story. She's like, no, I'm not, I'm going to get out of this. Mm-hmm. Which and I really really like this last page. You really have a knack of putting things much better than I am doing. So I'm just piggybacking off of you. <laughs> you say something and it sparks sparks an idea. Uh, okay. Uh, anything else on that issue, or should we move on to the next one? Nope, I'm done with that okay. one. Okay. Oh, I will. Sorry, I will add. That's no, okay. Um, because of the reference to the longbow hunters, I actually went back and reread that just to see. Mm-hmm. If there was any, or how um, I was going to say any truth to what what we're being told, but I wanted to see if there was what what kind of a continuity between the two stories there was, and um, I think what we get here, the suggestion is is that Dinah did not handle that situation in the Longbow Hunters well, mm-hmm. but when I read that story again. Um, she, she's never shown as being panicked, which I think is implied mm-hmm. here in, in Birds of Prey. Um, she's, she is shown as having been taken down by someone that normally would not be able to do it. And, mm-hmm. and it's all shown off, off panel. So you mm-hmm. never actually get to see what happened there, I think. Um, all you see is the result. But uh, what we do see is, uh, so they had the Longbow Hunters three-issue miniseries, and then after that they came out with a, a new Green Arrow Green Arrow series, and it's and I have I only have the the first issue of that, and I, re- I read that too, and that actually deals more with how how traumatic that experience was with her. Um, but I didn't I don't know I don't know how that ends up because I didn't I didn't read the rest of the, of the series. <laughs> But but there is there is that I mean there there is some truth to what Barbara is saying but like you said she she definitely is seeing it differently than Dinah does. I think Barbara also and we see this in the in um, the issue when she's in the diner. I think she's projecting a lot of her oh, yeah. own mm-hmm. her own fears into into Canary where she's seeing something different because when you were saying that you know she was taken by, down by somebody that normally wouldn't have taken her down mm-hmm. that's kind of the same thing that she says to Savant too. Or is it Savon or to Creole that 
you know, that normally she wouldn't, I think uh, Black Canary had said that herself, that, that um, he wasn't somebody that would have been able to take her down. Mm. You know, that it, it was kind of like a, I don't know, how do you say, it? not a sucker punch, but it was more of a, it just, ha- I guess it just, it was a, a fluke, I guess, yeah. I, for Savant, that he was able to take her down. Because I think she did mention something like that, that he normally he wouldn't be able to take her down. But I think a lot of that, too, is is, is really just is Babs projecting her own fears onto Black Canary. Because mm-hmm. that's what we see later on. So that maybe that's just a little hint that now we're getting. But we saw that later on kind of culminate. As you said, Like there's a lot of um, building of each of these characters in, in this little arc. It's little stages. So we have hit about the two-hour mark now, and I'm going to stop the episode here and continue the conversation about Birds of Prey issues 58 through 61 on the next episode of the podcast. So please come back and listen to part two of this discussion with MJ. Of course, I want to thank MJ for joining me on this first part of the discussion. Please see the show notes for links to MJ's webpage for her podcast and for her Twitter account as well. And go say hi. Thanks for listening, and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.